Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. We have our fourth online support group leader training, which is actually, it's a part two segment um, that will focus on how to host an expert guest speaker on your online support group meeting. So this time we will be addressing having an expert speaker other than from the medication and device industries. Um, and that could include someone like a, an exercise practitioner, um, and a Medicare or an insurance agent or some kind of therapist, like a physical therapist, occupational or speech, something like that. And so today we have the privilege of hosting uh, Cynthia Fox, who is the co-founder of the LSVT Big and Loud programs. We also have Willa Gorman um, from LSVT, who is the host and patient relations coordinator. Um, and so we're just really pleased to have them here today. Thank you for being here. And so for those of you who haven't attended one of our support group leader trainings before, my name is Shannon Elliott, and I am the manager of our support group leader network called NSYNC here at PMD Alliance. So it's nice to see you all. I see some, some, some familiar faces and some new ones, so welcome, welcome. Uh, similar to our last session uh, from two weeks ago with Dr. Salima Brill Brillman, you might have attended that, she spoke on the medication GoCovery. So today we will experience something similar. So it's, a, it's another training within a training. Cynthia will be giving an example presentation on her LSVT programs for us, just like it would be experienced by your support group members. And I will also be giving a little training on how to invite expert speakers to your group meetings. And we will be troubleshooting uh, some technical glitches that can sometimes occur during our online Zoom meetings, which we've all experienced <laughs> um, perhaps as a host or just as an attendee. So it does happen. So um, we're just normalizing it and, uh, and just going through um, some of the, the little troubleshooting um, ideas that we have to help you out with that. And we do have a lot to cover, so I'd love to get started. I'm going to begin um, by sharing my screen with you. I have a little PowerPoint to, to show you before Cynthia begins. So let me do that. Okay. All right. So I am, oops. And here's an example. <laughs> so I'm having, there we go. That's what I wanted to do. Um, there we go. Let's try this again. All right. So that's an example of being, of having a PowerPoint open already, as opposed to this screen where I can choose where I want to start. So that was my bad. And uh, so I'm starting from the beginning here and I'm going to play from the start so we can begin where we're supposed to. So let's go ahead and begin. So we've got a little how-to guide for you on inviting an expert uh, speaker. So you wanna begin with, uh, what's your topic of choice? So there are many, many things that you would like to address um, in your regular support group meetings that you would have in person. So it's the same thing here. So what do you wanna address? Um, we have a really great resource um, here at PMD Alliance, we have a support group and a bag um, reference guide, and it has a couple of pages um, that talks about many different kinds of speakers and topics uh, that you could bring to your groups. And so we have that list that we have that posted rather on our website. Um, so on our website, we have a COVID-19 tab and then a support group leaders resources page. And so I'll be showing that to you in a minute here within this PowerPoint presentation. And another way uh, to decide what topics you'd like to address, go ahead and poll your group members. I mean, they're the ones who are um, you're working with directly. Uh, you, you just should talk to them about what they're interested in hearing. So connecting with a potential speaker, how does that happen? So um, you might have a lot of personal connections, uh, people you might know in your city and your region who are doing various things within the, P the PD community. So uh, think of all of those different kinds of people and then maybe those in your support group will have connections. Um, so it's kind of that extended family sort of thing. So you're, you're just trying to connect with someone who can bring beneficial information to your group. 
You can also get ideas from the PMD Alliance YouTube videos. So we have a PMD Alliance um, uh, channel on YouTube. And so we have lots of different topics, lots of different kinds of speakers. So you can get ideas from that. And I wanted to mention today, since we have Cynthia on and Willa, uh, who is the, the host and, and um, patient relations coordinator, she is going to be uh, an immediate contact for you. So um, I will give you her information at the end of today's training. And you can contact her at any time um, if you would like to have an LSVT big or loud practitioner come visit your online support group. So of course, once you uh, connect with that potential speaker, uh, you're gonna determine the date and time and what kind of meeting you would like to have. So uh, would you like PowerPoint? Do you just want it to be conversational? If there's a question and answer session, do you want that done through the chat feature? Or do you wanna have people speaking to each other? So you can talk to that potential speaker um, about how you want that, the format of your meeting to, to go. And so confirming the details, um, you should, when uh, speaking with your, uh, your presenter on the phone ahead of time, um, you should just make it clear that they are responsible for any technical aspects. So if they do have a PowerPoint, that's not your job as a support group leader. You're there to help um, host them, but they should be able to share their screen and they have their own PowerPoint presentation and they should be able to run that for themselves. So just really have that clear communication going with them to, so that everyone understands what they're responsible for. Um, you as the support group leader, you should be sending the meeting information to your whole group members, all of your group members, and to the presenter. And that means your Zoom link and the password, everything that's necessary to get online the day of. And then you would want to sign on to that Zoom meeting a little early so you can greet the presenter. You're going to assign the co-hosting capabilities to that presenter so they have a little bit more um, of a, an ability to, to maneuver around as, as a co-host instead of just as an attendee. So make sure and do that. And then uh, if you're early, you can also test your audio and video and test a screen share of a PowerPoint if you need to. So go ahead and, uh, and get on maybe 10 or 15 minutes early to do all of that. And then just as a reminder, support group meetings shouldn't be recorded just to maintain that confidentiality that we like to have. Okay, so this uh, speaker and topic possibilities um, reference guide that I was just mentioning before. Um, here is uh, page one here. So it's in alphabetical order. So anything from an AARP representative to someone who talks about nutrition, um, having an ophthalmologist come on and talk about how PD affects the eyes. Um, so there are all these different um, ideas and topics and um, for potential speakers. So it's really just a good way to, to get your brain flowing on that. So that's page one and then this is page two. So this is the end of the alphabet alphabet here. So sleep, um, urology, um, palliative care. So there are so many ideas here that you can utilize. So with that, I'm going to stop my sharing and we can move to the second part of, of our presentation today. So we can get um, Cynthia, to take over from here, if you would, I'd love to have you introduce yourself and just let us know where you're based and, um, and your training and how you got into uh, creating LSVT Global. Excellent. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. It's great to see your smiling faces today. Um, again, I'm Cynthia Fox, and I'm a um, speech language pathologist by trade. I have been part of LSVT Global. I was one of the co-founders and I've been doing oh, this hey, Judy, thank you for, for a back. long time. Oh my yeah, goodness. we totally have um, here. this program. <laughs> I'm gonna mute her because she got a cell phone call right in the middle of Cynthia's introduction. So yes, I'm unmuting her and she's still um, going on and on. Presenting she's talking about rockets. So I'm going to mute her. So Cynthia, thank you for um, allowing that interruption to happen. So this is one of our first examples of a snafu that can happen when you're running a meeting. 
All right, so looks like Rebecca just got off the phone. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca, for playing. Um, so we just wanted to address, do you see how Rebecca, uh, for my on my screen, she's got that yellow box that popped up. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's going back and forth. Can you make noise, Rebecca? Sure, I can make noise. If, if you all are in gallery yeah. view, you might see that she's highlighting, her, her box shows up. So I know that that's where the sound is coming from. As a host, I have the ability to mute her. Okay, so that's just our first example. Let's move forward. Thank you, Cynthia. Absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. So now at this point, I will share my screen so that we can uh, see the slideshow here. And Okay, and you can see the slides okay? We sure can. Excellent. So uh, again, my, I'm Cynthia. I currently am a CEO and one of the co-founders of LSVT Global. I've been in the area of Parkinson's disease and specifically speech treatment research since 1994. So my entire professional career has been focused on improving communication and then many years later adding the LSVT big physical and occupational therapy, so movement for people with Parkinson's disease. So today our topic will be just a brief introduction to what are LSVT loud and LSVT big. And so we'll give a, a high level overview for you today. Slides today. Uh, this is just a little more details about me. Um, where I'm located is Tucson, Arizona. So uh, sitting here in the nice heat that has kicked <laughs> in. Um, our laboratory has uh, predominantly been located in Denver, Colorado, which is still where we do uh, our primary research, but our corporate office is here in Tucson. And I also just offer my disclosures in that, um, in terms of a non-financial disclosure, I have a preference for LSVT loud and LSVT big as treatment techniques. And I'm an employee of LSVT Global. I receive lecture honorarium from LSVT Global and have ownership interest. So the learning objectives for this presentation today are to, first of all, describe the need for effective speech, physical, and occupational therapies for people with Parkinson's, discuss the development and data on efficacious LSVT loud speech treatment and LSVT big for movement, briefly um, explain the treatment concepts, and then I'll end with how can you find an LSVT loud or LSVT big certified clinician. We know that Parkinson's disease is a growing challenge. Up to 8 million people worldwide are living with Parkinson's disease, and that number has been expected to double uh, by the year 2040. So there's an increasing need to, one, find a cure, but in the meantime, also, how can we help people live their best lives? Our mission then at LSVT Global has been to empower people with Parkinson's to restore and maintain their highest levels of functional communication, mobility, and independence in daily life through scientifically supported therapy programs. LSVT Loud, again, is our speech therapy. LSVT Big is our physical and occupational therapy. Today, rehabilitation is becoming a routine part of management in people with Parkinson's disease. And this is very exciting. I can tell you in 1994, when I began in this field, rehabilitation was a late stage referral. It rarely was for Parkinson's symptoms, but it was for secondary consequence. So a hip fracture from a fall, uh, pneumonia due to aspiration. Today, what we see being very different is proactive rehabilitation to potentially slow symptom progression and prevent those secondary consequences. So it's not one or the other, but rather typically it's the best pharmacological, neurosurgical, and speech, physical, and occupational therapies that collectively provide people with Parkinson's disease the best quality of life. So let's begin by looking at a video, both of LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. This is Shirley. She's one of our favorite 
purpose to show. She was 59 years old at the time I treated her and two and a half years post-diagnosis. She had started to notice changes in her speech and voice, and she'll discuss some of those on the video. Um, she is on her medication in the before video and the after video and had no medication changes. And so what you'll see is her before and after one month of intensive speech therapy. Have you noticed any changes in your speech or your voice that you would associate with Parkinson's? Yes, I don't speak loud enough a lot of times. Mm. Anything else? Of course. Uh-huh. Anything else? I stutter, which I never did before. Mm. Do this for me if you would. Take a deep breath and say ah for as long as you can. Uh, Good for you. Okay. Would you say Parkinson's disease has caused you to talk less? Yes. Because? Because I stutter and then I can't be heard. If there's noise in the house, like when the kids come over, Nobody pays attention to it because they can't hear me until I get mad and then yell. Take a deep breath and say ah for as long as you can. Have you noticed changes in your speech or your voice as a result of the speech therapy? Oh, yes. What have you noticed? I talk louder. I think louder. <laughs> I'm going to sing with the Sons of the Sons of Pioneers one of these days with my, my voice. <laughs> Good for you. That's excellent. Uh, what practicing do you do at home? My ahs, my highs, and my lows. And I read out the, the mail out loud. Excellent. Do you feel like practicing helps? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, do you feel as though people can understand you all of the time now? Majority of the time, unless it's my husband, and he'll say, what? I can't hear you. <laughs> Good for you. But I think he does that just to be cute. I think he does, too. <laughs> Has anyone commented that it's easier to understand you now? Oh, yes. I set some of our friends back when we went to their house, and I talked loud. Lou says, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> My daughter said, oh, Ma, that's you? <laughs> Isn't that good? Don't you feel wonderful? Oh, yeah, because now she can't say, I didn't understand what you said. Right? No excuses, right? Yeah, that's no right. excuses. All right. So what do you do when you want to be as easy to understand as possible? Think loud. We noticed. Okay, so that's a nice example of pretty typical changes that we see after treatment. Um, obviously, loudness was a target and her voice was louder, but within normal limits. We don't teach people to talk too loud. Her voice was clearer, her articulation was better, but I think what we love so much about what Shirley displays is that she's able to express that fun personality through her voice, through her face after treatment. And that's something that's very powerful about rehabilitation treatment, speech, physical, and occupational therapies. In this next video, we'll take a look at a gentleman who received LSVT big. He was 71 years old and it was 14 years post-diagnosis. He was referred for slowness, difficulty walking, falls and freezing. His Parkinson medications were optimized and there were no changes during the one month now of physical therapy. This video actually does not have any audio so I can talk to you about it while it's playing. On the left-hand side of the screen, what you see is him walking out of the treatment room after the first day of therapy, and then on the right side of the screen, walking out after the last day of therapy. What you can see on the left-hand side are some pretty classic Parkinson gait symptoms. Um, smaller steps, he was using a cane, he had a little bit of hesitation freezing at that, that doorway 
um, and not much arm swing. After treatment, what you see on the right is that he has bigger steps. Um, his arms are moving a bit better. Uh, we would look at that and say we could probably even make it better. But the most important thing, he's moving faster. He actually stopped using his cane. Um, and he's able to keep it up. So it's not just for a few steps and then stops. But he really has relearned a new way of walking after LSVT big. One of his goals was to improve his walking so he could do things like get out and go to the store with his wife, go to movies, play with his grandchildren, those meaningful activities for him. So where did all of this work begin? This is a picture of Mrs. Lee Silverman. She actually was a woman living with Parkinson disease. And when Dr. Lorraine Ramig met her, the Silverman family back in the late 1980s, their expressed wish was, if only we could hear and understand her. So some critical work that led to what today is known as LSVT Loud and LSVT Big began at the, the um, request of the Silverman family at a center in Scottsdale, Arizona called the Lee Silverman Center for Parkinson Disease. That center no longer exists, but when a formal protocol was developed, uh, Dr. Ramig named the treatment Lee Silverman voice treatment in Mrs. Silverman's honor. And today we typically just use the acronyms LSVT Loud for speech and LSVT Big for physical and occupational therapy. So 89% of people with Parkinson's disease will have changes in voice and speech. It's very prevalent. The most common things are the voice gets softer. There might be some hoarseness or breathiness monotone, so there's loss of pitch inflection and imprecise articulation. And this is a quote from a woman with Parkinson's disease, and this is the impact of these changes. I feel socially pushed into the corner and spoken over. So sometimes that um, impact of those changes really has a negative impact, not just on communication, but on self-concept as well. We also know that 68% of people with Parkinson's disease fall each year. Um, people with Parkinson's have two times greater risk for falling than community dwelling older individuals. Falls, gait impairment, postural instability leads to an increased mortality and morbidity and contribute to decreased uh, quality of life. So too often people with Parkinson's are not referred to physical therapy until they start falling. And again, our theme is always get to physical, occupational speech therapy before these things happen so that perhaps we can either slow or prevent their onset. Classical medical treatments alone are very important, don't get me wrong, but they do not consistently or significantly improve speech balance or lessen falls in Parkinson's. And that's why rehabilitation is needed as well. Hypokinesia, that reduced amplitude of movement that happens as a part of Parkinson's disease, affects both speech and movement. So we have a progressive decrease in loudness of speech, which is hypophonia. A progressive decrease in amplitude of handwriting, which is micrographia progressive shortening of stride length and arm swing during walking, and progressive decrease in speed and amplitude of duration with repetitive movements of the fingers or limb. We also know that Parkinson's disease is a complex disorder. It's not just motor systems. Uh, Cynthia, sound, I don't think we can hear you. For some reason, I think your audio has gone out. Huh, can you hear us? Okay, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Okay, so this is, this somehow is an example. Yeah, somehow she got muted. Thank you, Karen. This is one of our little snafus that we've planned. So you can, if you scroll over Cynthia's face, you will see that she is muted right now, but we're gonna do this on purpose, all right? So let's troubleshoot this for a second. So ideally, um, I would have gotten her cell phone number if I needed to use my, my phone to call her if necessary. We're not gonna do that right now, but we are going to demonstrate something called switch to phone audio. So Cynthia, 
in your, um, your mute menu, so in the bottom left-hand side of your toolbar, you're gonna see a little arrow that points up. If you open that up, you're gonna switch to phone audio. So you're gonna click on that option, switch to phone audio. A box is gonna pop up for you, okay? Now you're gonna use your cell phone. Okay, great. You're gonna call the uh, Zoom phone number that's listed there. Okay, so she's calling this, um, this phone number there. And I'm gonna go through all of this in a minute, um, how to do this. So uh, I'll outline all these steps, but she's going to enter the meeting ID number, and then there's going to be a participant ID number that she's going to enter. And then she is going to connect into this meeting through her cell phone. Okay, so, so you are muted on your cell phone now. So if you can unmute that. Let's see. There we go. Okay, try can again. Now? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay, great. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are demonstrating now how she can call in with her cell phone and connect to her video image. And she can proceed with giving her presentation, even though the audio on her computer went awry for some reason. Okay, so thank you for demonstrating that, Cynthia. Sure. And now we'll hang up and go back to computer audio, correct? <laughs> yes, just so um, it's a better, it's a better sound. So I just wanted to demonstrate okay. that. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, now you can unmute yourself again on your computer and we should be back in business. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay cool. Nice job. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for playing along with us so we could demonstrate how that works. Um, now to pick up where I left off, uh, Parkinson's disease, as you know, it's complex. So we have those motor symptoms, um, but there's also non-motor symptoms to consider. And we need to consider these as part of rehabilitation. Although we're not directly in some cases addressing them as they might be done you know, medically, indirectly, we certainly can have an impact. And so some of those symptoms might be depression, subtle neuropsychological changes, sensory proprioceptive changes, emotional changes, more anxiety or apathy, um, autonomic dysfunction and sleep disorders. And indirectly, exercise and rehab oftentimes can have a positive impact on some of those non-motor symptoms. So let's talk about some of the LSVT loud and LSVT uh, big concepts and really they're parallel key concepts. So the first concept is we target amplitude. If Parkinson's has scaled you down, we're using amplitude to override that and scale you back up either through a louder voice or bigger movement. So what we see on the left, if the voice is too small or movements are too small, with a single cue of amplitude, talk louder, move bigger, we can drive more effort to increase that amplitude. The most important thing to recognize is that it's always healthy, healthy vocal loudness, healthy movement amplitude. So again, it's not teaching somebody to talk too loud, to move too big, and it's why the skill of a speech, physical, or occupational therapist is really important. Um, we know how to gradually improve your amplitude in a way that doesn't hurt your body, either uh, physically or from um, your voice. So we wanna work together over time to gradually improve your loudness and your bigness to a more normal level. The mode of delivery is intensive and high effort. It takes that level of intensity to form new habits. So the minimum dosage for efficacy as documented by our scientific studies, four consecutive days a week for four consecutive weeks. So you get 16 sessions in one month's time. These are one hour treatment sessions and they're individual, not group therapy. And it's because we address your individual challenges and that simply can't be done in a group setting. 
you will also have daily homework practice, daily carryover exercises, all 30 days of the month. Uh, the treatment again is delivered by LSVT Big Certified Physical or Occupational Therapist or LSVT Loud Certified Speech Therapist. While you're with us for that month, one of our goals is really to help you create a lifelong habit for practice so that after that one month of treatment is over, you know exactly what to do to keep practicing. One of the very unique things about LSVT programs is that we address this issue called calibration. These are barriers to generalization. So while we may get you moving bigger or talking louder with us in the treatment room, there are challenges that make it difficult for you to automatically take that out into your daily life. These include a sensory disorder. So people with Parkinson's disease often have spot soft speech, but to them, it feels normal. And when we get them louder, it feels too loud. Similarly, they may have slower and smaller movements, but they may not recognize how much slower or smaller they've gotten. We've had patients say, well, I think my spouse is walking faster now. There's a problem with internal cueing. And so the, the reality is oftentimes when we say move bigger, speak louder, you physiologically can achieve that goal. But for some reason with Parkinson's, you're not internally cueing yourself to do that. And so through treatment, we retrain that internal cue. And then even in early Parkinson's disease, there can be small changes in thinking, slower thinking, learning may take a little bit longer. So we need a treatment approach that takes that into account, it has a simple focus, redundant uh, uh, cue that's overlearned. So specifically with an LSVT loud treatment session, it's broken into two halves. The first half of the session are spent on what we call our daily exercises. These include long ah uh, that we hold for uh, as long as you can at a healthy loudness, a minimum of 15 repetitions. Then we work on high low ahs. So ah uh, ah. Uh, this works to improve intonation. Then we have you come up with a list of 10 things that you say absolutely every day. Where are my glasses? I love you. And we practice those so that when you're at home and you say, where are my glasses? It becomes a cue or a hook or a reminder to remember to think loud. That first half of the session kind of scales up your voice. And then in the second half of the session, we systematically train that into speech. Across the four weeks, we increase length of utterance and difficulty of the type of speaking from words and phrases to sentences to paragraph reading to conversation. And we tailor that to your specific interests and your long-term communication goals. We also, as I mentioned, include daily homework and daily carryover. So this is kind of the LSVT loud goal. We use those treatment exercises, the long odds, the high, low odds to improve your physiology. But the ultimate goal is that you use a louder voice in conversational speech outside of the treatment room. If it were easy, we could do treatment in a week maybe, and that would happen. But because of the sensory problem, it takes time. When we get you louder, inevitably, you are going to feel like you're shouting, you're talking too loud. And if it feels funny to you, you'll walk out the door and revert back to that softer voice. So we address this mismatch in a person with Parkinson's perception of their vocal loudness and how other people perceive it. And so that by the end of treatment, you really recognize and feel that even though it may feel a bit too loud to me, it's within normal limits, other people perceive it as normal and it's very positive. In about 2000, we began the translation of LSVT loud speech treatment to a physical and occupational therapy. And this was a collaboration between our team and two physical therapists at the University of Arizona, Dr. Becky Farley and Dr. Gail Koshlin. And that grew into what is known today as LSVT big. LSVT big was modeled exactly after the LSVT loud treatment. 
So the first half of the session are spent on daily exercises. The first two are what we call sustain. So just like we hold that ah, uh, we get to the final position and we hold those for a count of 10. The next three exercises are directional. So with the voice, we go high and low. Uh, with LSVT Big, we're doing a forward step, a backward step, side to side steps. The last two exercises, six and seven, are unique to LSVT Big. And these really work to overcome uh, the challenge of you may start big, but this doesn't stay big. So these are repetitive big motions. Everybody will have some walking big every treatment session. The distance and time may vary. And then we have functional component tasks. As you recall with LSVT Loud, we have those 10 phrases or sentences that remind you or hook you into your louder voice. Similarly, we'll come up with uh, five big movements. For everybody, sit to stand is one of them because everybody has to get up out of their chair. Other things might be like pulling your keys out of your pocket, using your cell phone, putting your glasses on your face. So simple movements, overlearn, so that every time you go to stand up out of your chair, you think about that big movement. Then we take that bigger movement we've scaled up in that first half of the session and train it into a hierarchy. So you, along with your therapist, as part of your assessment, will identify anywhere from one to three long-term goals. It might be getting out of the bed at night to be able to go to the bathroom and back to bed. It might be something recreational, like playing golf or tennis or gardening. It might be getting in and out of the car. Across the four weeks of treatment, your therapist will work in blocked and random practice to gradually improve that skill using bigger, uh, more functional movements. And similarly, you'll have daily homework and daily carryover exercises. These are some uh, examples of those seven daily exercises. Again, the first two are done seated, stepping, and repetitive movements. While um, the standard exercises graduate to uh, standing, all of the LSVT big exercises can be adapted to be done in a seated position. They can even be adapted to a supine position for patients who may need to start in, um, in bed learning some of the basic exercises. Just like with LSVT Loud as well, our goal is to take this exercise we do, like this rock and reach exercise you see on the left-hand side, but ultimately use that to improve a functional activity, like reaching up on a shelf to grab a book um, or whatever it is that's important to you. Similarly, we are going to get you moving bigger moving better, more functional, but to you, it may feel too big. And it's not uncommon when we get people walking bigger initially, they're like, people will think I'm crazy if I walk like this. So we, again, have to retrain your sensory perception of movement to recognize what feels too big to you is actually perceived as normal. Both for LSVT Loud and for LSVT Big, we use things like audio playback, video playback, so that we can show you how it sounds and how it looks when you're using that greater amplitude and bigger movements, and you begin to recognize, oh yeah, you're right, that doesn't sound too loud, that doesn't look crazy. So let's just touch on here uh, about the research related to LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. One of the unique aspects in particular about LSVT Loud is the very long and substantial scientific basis for the treatment. It's been over 30 plus years, again, led by Dr. Lorraine Ramick. And you see our initial invention and timeline um, that began at that Lee Silverman Center for Parkinson's Disease. Dr. Ramig went on to receive funding from the National Institutes of Health, and we have had three randomized controlled trials related to LSVT Loud. The development of LSVT Big, again, began about 2000, and there have been two published randomized controlled trials on LSVT Big. This later phase work here at the bottom of the, the the slide is related to our clinical implementation. So 
It's one thing to develop a treatment, write the science, publish it in journals. It's another thing to say, hey, how do we scale that into clinical practice to the point that the fidelity of treatment that patients receive matches what we did in our research studies. These are uh, just graphs on our three randomized controlled trials for LSVT loud. I won't go through all the details of these, just pointing out this first study, we compared LSVT voice treatment to a respiratory target. We measured people pre, post, six, 12 and 24 months after treatment. The measure that we're seeing here on all these graphs are on the um, y-axis here, are decibels of sound pressure level. So the higher up, the greater the loudness. And on the x-axis is time. And so in this first study, um, we have the respiratory treatment in red, the LSVT loud in blue. And what we found was even two years after the initial treatment was delivered, individuals with Parkinson's disease were still statistically significantly louder than they were pre-treatment and then an alternative treatment group. The second randomized controlled trial compared LSVT loud to an untreated group. And the third randomized controlled trial compared LSVT loud to an articulatory treatment and an untreated group. And the summary of all of these is that the focus on voice and voice training as a part of LSVT loud was superior to other targets. All of these studies had matched dosage, matched intensity, matched homework. Um, Therapists had equal enthusiasm, data analysis was blinded, uncued task, and data were collected by someone other than the therapist. Beyond those efficacy studies, we have studied many other elements of communication, swallowing, facial expression, and we have three neuroimaging studies showing changes in the brain following intensive LSVT lab treatment. In terms of LSVT big, this was our first randomized, uh, the first randomized controlled trial that actually came out of a group in Germany, Dr. George Ebersbach and colleagues. What they looked at was LSVT big compared to a Nordic walking exercise program or a home exercise program. The outcome measure was change in motor score of the United Parkinson disease rating scale. And on this scale, a decrease is an improvement. What we see in the solid line, baseline to four weeks to 16 weeks was no real improvement in the UPDRS motor score. The dotted line here was pretreatment. At, at this program was two times a week for eight weeks, so post-treatment and 16 weeks again, no improvement in the score. In comparison with LSVT big, we saw a statistically significant improvement immediately post-treatment that was maintained out to 16 weeks. So these data were simply the first to look at improvements following LSVT big and documenting changes. Since then, smaller studies have looked at a range of other outcome measures, trunk rotation, how big of steps, reaction time, dual tasking, fall risk, and have also reported uh, a number of positive findings following LSVT big treatment. But there's always, always more research to be done. If you want to learn more about the research related to LSVT lab, on our blog, which is blog.lsvtglobal.com, there is a research button. You can download our complete reference list. You can look at references related to specific areas. And for any articles that we're allowed to uh, provide open access, you can actually download the studies uh, and review them for yourselves. So as I mentioned a, a bit ago, it's one thing to have your one month of intensive treatment, but really exercise, rehabilitation, it's lifelong. It should be lifelong um, as just a general health practice, but in particular for people with Parkinson's disease becomes very important. So after treatment is over, we encourage 
daily practice and you're taught how to do that as part of the treatment. We also have uh, homework helper videos that some people like to follow along with. We also have group exercise options. So the groups come after individual treatment is over. These are called Lab for Life, Big for Life. Um, we have them in person. They are now also offered through a tele uh, option, so through Zoom. And it's a great way to now come together with your, with your peers who've also completed either LSVT Loud or LSVT Big. There's always an element of doing those core daily exercises, but then some fun interactive exercise or communication activity. We encourage regular tune-ups, so revisiting your speech, physical, or occupational therapist every three to 12 months. It will vary, and you'll establish that uh, schedule with your therapist, and sometimes you might need to actually come back in for a few treatment sessions. Not necessarily all 16 again, but a few sessions to get you back on track. And then, of course, we encourage you to have other enjoyable activities um, for fitness. And now I'm getting a fire alarm here. So we got an unintended snafu. I'm not gonna worry about it. Wow. I, they've been testing, they've been testing. So I'm not worried. <laughs> I didn't plan that, Cynthia, I didn't. That's great. Um, okay, so just in closing, if you're interested to get started with an LSVT Loud or LSVT Big uh, therapist, ask your doctor for a referral and a prescription for speech or physical and occupational therapy for an evaluation and treatment. On our website at lsvtglobal.com, there's this giant orange button that says find LSVT clinicians. You can type in your zip code, up pops a list. If you click type of organization and the clinician lists it, you can see if they're a home health, outpatient, private practice, and that may help guide where you're looking. Also, you can just contact us at any time and we will help you with that search. And Willa, who you met at the beginning, is our person who manages that. Key questions to ask, um, are you accepting patients? Do you deliver the gold standard dosage? LSVT Loud and LSVT Big are only delivered four days a week for four weeks, individual 60-minute sessions, daily homework, daily carryover. There are no modified versions based upon, you're simply getting something that is not what I just described and what has that solid research base. Sometimes we also ask, you know, how many patients have you treated? You know, have you had good outcomes? Do you have a follow-up program? And that just helps you get a little bit more information about the therapist in your area. This was a, a nice concluding, uh, testimonial from a gentleman who received both LSVT Loud and LSVT Big. And Jim stated, more than one year later, I still continue my LSVT Big and LSVT Loud exercises almost daily. I have the confidence in my body to continue doing the things I love, gardening, walking with my wife, spending time with my family, traveling and reading poetry on the radio. Parkinson's is my enemy but thanks to LSVT programs, I will prevail. And so I think we're right on time. I say thank you. Our email is here. Our website is here. We are certainly happy to provide you with any additional information. And we'll move now to back to gallery view. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Wow, thank you so much. That's super informative. I love how it's a similar approach, like it's about amplitude, you know, the, the voice and then the body, and it's just all about, you know, it's, 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 that's what it's about. So it's, it's easy to carry over those two philosophies, but back. Yeah, so definitely. Really um, it's really neat. Um, wow. Okay. So thank you for that. Is everyone back into the gallery view? So do you see everyone's picture so we can take a few um, questions for, from, uh, for Cynthia. Oh my goodness. And if you happen to look into your chat, <laughs> so here's a demonstration of something that we would like to um, prevent from happening is uh, an accidental chat that was meant for one person and it goes to the whole group. So if you don't know where the chat box is, you're going to hover your mouse over your Zoom window and click on the chat bubble 
box at the bottom, it's going to open a chat pane to the side. <laughs> so Rachel, who is um, one of my colleagues on staff, can you, can you wave your hand and say hello, Rachel, so you pop up? Yeah, there we go. So Hi, everybody. She, she meant to send me a private message. She says, oh my gosh, Shannon, I had the craziest dream this weekend. Brad Pitt. Okay, yes, I relate. Um, and so that was meant to go to me. It went to the whole group. So we need to really understand what that means to send a private message versus a message to everyone. So we will address that in the training to follow. So thank you for demonstrating that, Rachel. It does happen, believe me. <laughs> we want to avoid that if we can. Okay, um, so uh, I saw a couple of questions in the chat, Cynthia. Um, okay. We have something from Sue. She says, I've been walking with Nordic poles for two months. I think I heard you say that this is not as effective as LSVT big. Is that so? P.S. and better than what? Purpose. Right. Okay. I if you're walking with Nordic poles and you're moving and it's working for you, great, keep doing that. Um, what I was explaining was actually a very controlled study. So in this particular study, they used that as a comparison to LSVT big. And again, the third treatment group was just a home exercise. So in that study, patients came in, they were evaluated uh, by a neurologist who didn't know what treatment they had, if they had treatment at all. Um, so it was a blinded analysis. Then the treatments were delivered. LSVT big was the four days a week for four weeks individual treatment. The Nordic walking group was matched for total sessions, but not dosage. So it was twice a week for eight weeks. And then the home exercise program, people were given a program and just instructed, do it on your own at home for one month. And so in that controlled study, they found that the greatest improvement on that measure, the United Parkinson Disease Rating Scale Motor Score, was for that individual LSVT big treatment. Um, but it, it, any exercise that you can get out and do, um, we would absolutely say do that. What sometimes you can get out of LSVT big would be a transfer of the exercise into functional. So if there's a task, for example, buttoning, writing, typing on the computer, that's a problem. We would work individually with you on that beyond just those core exercises. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Cynthia. And we have another question from Karen. What does it cost for LSVT big mm. allowed? Yeah, that will depend on your facility, but it's um, each session is comparable to a typical speech treatment session or physical or occupational therapy session. Most insurances, if they cover speech, physical, and occupational therapy, Medicare included, cover LSVT loud and LSVT big. So it's simply a type of speech, PT, or OT treatments. What's been, you know, uh, COVID has been disastrous, it's devastating, um, but if we look for some silver linings, what it has done, it has accelerated or at least temporarily allowed for Medicare coverage of telehealth of speech, physical, and occupational therapies. And so prior to this, you had to be in person at the clinic, and now we're seeing some openings for telepractice or tele-LSVT lab, tele-LSVT big, or other speech, physical, and occupational therapies, <clears throat> excuse me, to be covered by Medicare. Um, so that's exciting. And those are changes, all of our national organizations, um, American Speech Language Hearing as Organization, APTA, AOTA, are going to try to make permanent so they don't get rolled back once the COVID pandemic is under control. On that note, Cynthia, um, just so I make sure I understood correctly, um, the individual sessions, the four week, uh, for four weeks in a row, can those be done via telehealth? Or Okay, so at this point, that, that's yes. an option? Okay. They can be, and uh, it's more advanced for LSVT loud. And in fact, we have um, we have individual we have research data. So actually, published research studies that show systematically LSVT loud by telehealth is equivalent to LSVT loud in person. 
The LSVT big via telehealth is very new, and I think we have a lot to learn. Um, one of the key variables, variables will be the appropriate person. So somebody who is a a very um, high risk for uh, balance or falls may not be the best candidate for telepractice. The clinician might want to be there for safety reasons, but I think we're going to learn a lot. On our website is actually uh, that big orange button, find LSVT clinicians. There's also a, a click to find e -loud providers. Those are people who do telepractice. So we can help connect you specifically with a practitioner um, who does telepractice. And I see that's a, a client uh, or a, a question coming through. Willa can be very helpful in, in finding practitioners for you. One of the things with telepractice as well is that as a therapist, we still have to abide by um, uh, licensure guidelines. So I have to, if I'm delivering treatment, I'm licensed in Arizona. I can only deliver to people who are in Arizona, unless I get additional state licenses. But Will is very good about helping to try to coordinate and make those connections. Can you wave, Willa? Yes, so there she is. And uh, she is uh, who I will be connecting you with um, as far as an email address. So that's not just to find a practitioner maybe for yourself, but also to find a speaker for your online support group. So she's gonna, she's agreed to do that. So thank you so much, Willa. You're Very welcome, helpful. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> thank you. Okay, excellent. Well, unless we have any other burning questions for Cynthia, I'd like to move forward and address some of those technical snafus that happened during our presentation today. So you can unmute yourself if you have anything you'd really love to know from Cynthia before we move on. Okay, excellent. So I will begin sharing my screen again and let's talk through some of those things that happened and what we would do if they were to happen in your groups. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. Is that, can you see it? Okay, great. All right, so background noise, that can happen quite easily. Um, so we probably know that there is an option to be muted or unmuted when you're attending a Zoom meeting. So this is really important when it comes to having a large group and there's the potential for um, someone to be uh, uh, providing <laughs> this background noise that you don't really want. Um, so we want to identify the source of the unwanted background noise and how do we do that? So we're going to look at our screen and we're gonna look for a yellow box or a line that appears around the participant's image. So here's a little screenshot of an actual Zoom meeting that happened. And hopefully you can see right here uh, in the center of this yellow box. So the pr presenter, Alistair, um, was speaking and that's why his, uh, the box shows up around him. So that's a way to see if, if he was um, highlighted and then say Rebecca down here, forgot to mute herself, she got a cell phone call, and then the, the yellow would be going back and forth between Rebecca and Alistair. So you would know that Rebecca is the culprit. And so she is the one that needs to, um, to, to be muted in this situation. You can also utilize what's called the participants pane which is a, a, a feature on Zoom that we use. So um, what I'd like you to do is to um, hover over your screen and you'll see down by the chat option, there's something called a participants button. And um, if you click on that, here is a screenshot of what the participants pane looks like on the side. So it's basically a listing of all the names of people who are in your Zoom meeting at the time. and um, when someone is creating noise, they tend to move, the, the list shifts and they tend to move toward the top of the list and then their microphone icon is activated. So I just want to point out here, this yellow box is around Robert. He's speaking and he has moved up toward the top of the list and then you'll see here that his little microphone, it starts to activate. It starts to fill up and, and retreat and empty. So you can see that his microphone is the one 
that is being uh, sparked by his voice or, or some background noise, something like that. So as a, as a support group leader, um, hopefully you will have some help. You might have a co-host. So as a host or a co-host of a, of a Zoom meeting, you can mute the source of the unwanted noise, all right? So um, the way you can do that is to hover your, your mouse over the screen or, or over the picture of the person who's making noise and it, it'll give you an option to mute them. You can do it there. Or within the participants pane, I see Robert, he's activated here, so I can actually click on that little microphone icon and it will turn into this. It will turn into this um, crossed out red microphone saying that it's muted. So that will take care of it as well. So something you, you can also do um, before your support group uh, meets each time, you can remind them. To mute, to mute themselves when it's appropriate. So sometimes they might be several people in the room and they start to have a conversation with each other and then it's, it's activating this background noise, but they forget that, that they can be heard by you. So if you encourage them to go ahead and mute themselves um, whenever they're not speaking, that's helpful for the whole group. All right, so when the speaker's audio stops working, so you remember when all of a sudden, Cynthia was presenting and then we couldn't hear her anymore. So sometimes uh, that, that can happen for a number of reasons. Bandwidth can be something. Um, so uh, she just happened to mute herself to demonstrate this. Um, so um, first of all, we want to um, make sure before the meeting ever happens to get the cell phone number of the speaker. So just in case something like that happens, you wanna be able to communicate with them. So you would want to have their cell phone number or their landline, doesn't matter. And then you would be able to call them and have a conversation just so you can communicate about what to do next. So that's just something to, to check off the list to make sure you do. And, and then ensure that the speaker is unmuted. There's no red line through the microphone. So what does that look like? Here's a little graphic here. So at the bottom um, of your screen, um, if you hover your mouse over, you'll see at the bottom left-hand side, um, if you're on a computer, um, you're going to see this mute option here. So this means that audio is not muted. You can be heard. But if you click on that, it just toggles back and forth between mute and unmute. If you click on it, then the red line indicates that audio is, is muted. So hopefully that's, that's pretty clear. So make sure that the speaker is not muted. Um, you can also ask the speaker to close any other unneeded programs on his or her computer to increase bandwidth. So maybe they have Microsoft Word open and the music program open and all these things that aren't needed. So anytime your computer is running many different things at the same time, it can affect the quality of the video and the audio coming through Zoom. So you can also ask the speaker to go ahead and close other unneeded programs. You can also ask them to turn off the video. So say that uh, Cynthia was giving her uh, PowerPoint presentation and the, the audio started to act a little funny. If we asked her to turn off the video, we wouldn't be able to see her, which is okay. As long as we can hear her and see her slides, that could help as well. And so again, I'll ask you to hover your mouse over your Zoom window right now. And at the bottom left-hand part of your screen, you'll see that video camera icon. So it'll either be slashed out, which means you cannot be seen, video is off, or if you toggle back to the other direction or to the other option, um, then you can be seen. Um, so uh, you might know if you've already hosted support group meetings online. When you provide all of that information about Zoom, usually there's a link, you know, it's a PMD Alliance Zoom link. So people are gonna click on that and connect via their computer. But there's also information below that and it's all those phone numbers and then the meeting ID number and a password. So people can call in with their phones um, and connect that way. So if the speaker is her, his or her video is fine, but we can't hear them, they can always just call in using those phone numbers and the participant ID and the meeting ID to, to get connected. But um, what I'm gonna train you on right now is how to switch to phone audio, which is what we actually did with Cynthia. And that's the ideal 
option, and I'll show you why. Okay, so switching to phone audio. Um, so what we're going to do is again, if you hover over your screen, the very uh, bottom left icon there is that microphone button. That's your mute and unmute uh, location. I'm gonna move this over. So you're gonna see a little arrow that points up. And, and it's right here. So this is um, a screenshot of the bottom of your screen. This is your mute unmute menu. And right here is a little arrow. So if you click on that arrow there, this menu is gonna pop up, okay? So the next thing that the speaker would do, and you can actually lead them through these steps just by telling them if they can hear you, then um, this will work just fine. So once they've opened up this menu, you're gonna see the switch to phone audio option and they're gonna click on it, all right? So when they click on it, a box is going to pop up on their screen that looks just like this. And it has a bunch of phone numbers here and all of them can be used. It's just because Zoom is growing and they need a lot more capacity for so many people using all, um, all of these meetings all day. So um, there are phone numbers to call and so they would be dialing one of these phone numbers on their cell phone or landline. And then they're going to enter the meeting ID when prompted. It's usually, I think it's followed by a pound key. And then they also enter the participant ID. And so what that does, entering the participant ID is what helps Zoom know that the cell phone call that's being made is connected to that particular video. And so it actually, zoom, it puts them together and the speaker will reconnect to the Zoom call and the, their audio and video will sync up. And so that's oppo opposed to having their video show up and then they just call on the cell phone without using the participant ID. It will show up as a separate um, attendee with a cell phone number, if that makes sense. So uh, it's helpful to the speakers if their cell phone isn't, number isn't just broadcast to, to everybody. So it's just better, it hides the phone number and then it makes um, everything work in conjunction. So hopefully that's making sense. I can't see any of you right now as I do this presentation. So um, we'll address some questions later if you have them. Okay, so here's our last snafu, thanks to Rachel. So she sent me that private message that was kind of inappropriate. <laughs> Not too inappropriate, thank goodness. And so um, what we wanna do, and I'd like to have you try this if you don't, don't already have your chat pane open, is hover your mouse over your screen and at the bottom you're gonna see that chat option. So you're gonna click on that and it's gonna open a chat pane. So I've taken a screenshot of what a chat pane looks like. Here's the participants pane, which we've already seen in the last example. So down here is our chat pane. This is how we can, uh, type messages to each other. So we wanna look at the very, very bottom and it says type message here to send a message. So that's what we wanna locate first, all right? And then we wanna make sure that um, the person we wanna actually communicate with is, is, is highlighted, okay? So they're gonna be highlighted in blue. So here's another example. This is from the other day, Rebecca and I had a private conversation. You can see the, the privately um, in red here, which indicates it's private. It really helps to differentiate that. So you wanna make sure in right here in this two area here, two colon, and then Rebecca, if I type a message and hit send, hit enter, then it's gonna to go to her privately. And so we can use a drop down menu uh, to change the recipient of your message. So hopefully you can see this. So, right here, the two, and then we have Rebecca. So you see this little arrow? If you, if you click on this, then it's going to open up a menu of all of the participants in the meeting at that time. So if I wanted to click on everyone, for instance, if I wanted everyone to see my, my message, then I would click on everyone here. And then it would make sure and uh, turn itself into blue. So then I can type my message and know that it's going to everyone. So hopefully that's, that's pretty clear, um, but it's really important just to double check and with so many chat messages going on, just to make sure that you are sending 
the message to the right person. Okay, so I am going to stop my share screen and take some questions. So hopefully, there we are. Okay, I see some things have come in while I was presenting. All righty, so, and now I've got a glare because I've got the sunshine coming in from behind me, so I'm going to keep moving my computer closer. <laughs> I'll move back. All right. Okay, so it looks like Norma, can you make the screen bigger? So there's only one row of attendees on the right. I am seeing only, I'm seeing half of your screen, half, half gallery. gallery. Okay, so I'm not quite sure. Um, I think I was able to answer Norma's question. Oh, great. Um, basically, what I've noticed is there is a line that happens in between the presentation and the people that are in the gallery. And you can make more people in the gallery show up if you hover your screen in the middle and shift it or you can make the presentation bigger by doing it the opposite way and then having one line of people. Does that make sense? I think so. And um, if your participants pane and chat pane are also open, it's just going to squish all those faces even smaller. So if you want to make sure and have the big biggest view of either the PowerPoint presentation or the other folks' faces who are in the meeting, then you want to go ahead and click out of your participants pane in your chat pane just to make sure the, the um, pictures are as big as possible. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, yes. yes, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Joan, is there a way to deal with video that is distracting? Video, Joan, where are you? Can you, can you explain a little bit more what, about your question? You can unmute yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> you are. Sometimes there are people, I sound like I have Parkinson's. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, there are people who are moving around, their computer is upside down. Um, they come in and out. And what I do personally is I block their, their little thing on the, I put something in front of it so I can't see them anymore. Right. But if there are a lot of people doing that, um, I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah, I think there, I would approach it in two ways. First, I would say at the beginning of your meeting, um, just let people know, because I think a lot of times they don't realize that the, the commotion and maybe they're moving around the house and they've got an iPad. And so it, it makes you dizzy, you know, to see all of that. So if you could just let them know and say, if you could stay still and like have your computer or your iPad in one place, that would be very helpful for us. Thank you. Or if um, someone is just not able to do that for some reason, you as a host, you have the capability and we can't try that right now because you're not hosts or co-hosts, but over each um, person's image, there's a little ellipsis, so three dots in a row that comes up. If you hover your mouse over someone's picture, you won't see it right now, but I, I can tell you, you can open that little menu and you can actually stop their video. You could actually, you know, black them out, kind of like you are, Joan. You know how you've, um, you don't have a video showing? Right. Um, you can actually do that to someone if necessary. I don't know if anyone had seen, um, it was a terrible thing that happened in someone's uh, professional Zoom meeting and it became a YouTube video and shared all over, but they accidentally brought their iPad into the bathroom with them and they had it playing and it was awful. And so luckily um, someone on the team, the host realized and they were able to stop the video by doing just that but you know that like how awful so sometimes things happen and we get in our own worlds we don't think anyone's watching but they are <laughs> so uh that's just a good option to have as a host or a co-host is to be able to hover over someone's image hit the ellipsis pull it down stop video all right so that would be my suggestion there thank you sure um did lsvt training several years ago 
Okay, so this is a question for Cynthia. I know that she has stopped her video. She's asking if a CD uh, has, has um, been created, a new one. So I'm not sure if Cynthia is there. Are you there, Cynthia? I'm here, yes. And I actually, I sent uh, a Sue a, a private response to that as well. Um, okay. It sounds like you've worn it out, but if you email me, I'll help you get connected up with a new one. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Cynthia. Karen's asking, are there long distance charges for calling in? Um, I would assume that yes. Uh, you know how we, most of us have cell phones these days and so cell phones don't really, you know, you don't have to deal with the long distance anymore. But I believe that if you were to call uh, from a landline because it's not an 800 number, then it, then it probably would be. That's my, that's my guess. So that's uh, unfortunate. Um, are you able to save a video recording of the speaker without displaying the participants? So because uh, we are talking about online support group meetings and having a speaker come, come speak for one of those, we, um, we are asking that they aren't recorded at all. Um, it's just for confidentiality and privacy, things like that. So um, that's sort of a stipulation that we have here. So let's, let's try to keep, keep with that if we could. Shannon? Yes. Oh, hi, Nancy. Hi, I'm going to ask the question. So we have somebody coming to a Zoom meeting as a speaker. We want to archive the presentation. Totally understand about not recording with participants there, but how can we archive or do we have to turn it into a webinar? This is where um, Rebecca, who's on our staff, would be better to answer that question. She's really good with knowing the difference between a regular Zoom meeting and then a webinar meeting. And sometimes mm -hmm. those webinars are even HIPAA compliant. There are all these different technical things that I'm not um, really aware of. So I will keep your question, Norma, and we will uh, do some research on that and let you know. I could see a, a potential, uh, maybe, <laughs> of only recording the presentation itself, nothing beforehand, nothing after, and trying to figure out a way to hide the participants. But um, that's going to take a little bit of research. So thank you for the good question. Um, where is the participant ID? So why don't we all go through this together? So this is the, the switch to phone audio option. And this is not just for a speaker. So say, say that um, someone in your group is having audio issues. You can have them go through this very same protocol and they can join the meeting with their video from their computer that's working properly. And then they can call in with a phone. Okay, so this is not only for a speaker, but for everybody. So hover your mouse over the screen if you would. In the lower left hand corner, you see a microphone and right next to it, just to the right of it, is a little arrow that's pointing up. So go ahead and just click on that little arrow. Do you see a menu that shoots up, it pops up above that. Now on my screen, it's one, two, three, from the bottom, it says switch to phone audio. Does everyone see that? Go ahead and click on it. Nothing bad's gonna happen. Just go, just go ahead and see how this works. So switch to phone audio. You should get a little pop-up box. Do you see that? And it says dial, and then it has one, it has six different phone numbers. Okay, these are all the phone numbers that aren't 800 numbers. So if you use a landline, they probably will cost long distance charges. So what you would do is use your phone and call one of those numbers. It's Zoom is going to answer. It's an automated Zoom um, message. She's going to say, please enter your meeting ID. Do you see right below the phone numbers, meeting ID. So 868-297-555 and then you would hit pound to enter. She says, please enter your participant ID. And right below that, we're all gonna have different numbers because they're all associated to our computers, okay? So when you enter that participant ID, the phone call zoom, will take you right into the meeting and will connect directly to your video, like to your image. So it's all connected. Is that clear, Norma? 
Yeah. Your, um, yeah. Your, yes. Um, uh, do they need to write it down um, because this screen will uh, go away um, when they would have to write the participant ID in? Um, you can leave that little box open as you're doing all the calling. You can you can call in the number mm -hmm. and then I can look back on the little screen there and, and enter the ID and then I can do the same thing for the okay. participant ID. Okay, yeah, that's okay. So they're entering it onto their phone. Onto their and phone. They, and, and the they, box can still be up on their computer exactly, or iPad. Exactly. Sorry. And then they X out if you go to the to the corner to X out that, that box and it goes away and you can see the people again. Okay. Yeah? All right, thank okay. you. Sure. Ooh, this is a good one, Charlene. Is it possible to delete an inappropriate message sent to everyone? <laughs> no. <laughs> if it goes in the chat, it stays in the chat. And so that's why we wanna really make sure that we send our messages to the right person, okay? Karen. I've had people accidentally click on their share screen button and then their computer screen. <laughs> I know it's, it's kind of a personal pet peeve of mine. Um, I don't know if you, you see it the same way I do on my computer. The share screen button, go ahead and hover over your Zoom window at the bottom in the center. It's bright green. Share screen. And that's people are like, ooh, that looks like go. Like I should go there. And no, um, it's, it's, it has such this invitation to, to click on it. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's not meant to be, you know, people shouldn't really be sharing um, their, their screens. And next week, little plug for next Monday, same time, same place, we're going to do a more technical training on Zoom um, training, and we're going to talk about screen sharing. And there are ways to actually prevent other people from sharing their screens ahead of time, but I, I'm not gonna go through all of that right now. Um, usually it's just an innocent oopsie daisy, but then they get all flustered and sometimes it's hard to figure out how to get out of it. So we will be talking about all of that next time. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question about using two computers. Can you use one as a control screen and another as a display screen? So this is a good question um, that I have no experience with. I have a little laptop and that's all I've got. Some people have three screens on this major desk, you know, and they, they really have a setup, but I have never done that. So I'm going to have to do some research on that. Thank you for asking. Okay. How to have a speaker as the main frame while they are doing the presentation. So Irene, does that mean that you want their face instead, instead of the PowerPoint? Irene, I don't see you here. Are you on the second page? Irene, you're still muted. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, okay? There you go, you're unmuted. I'm thinking that if a person comes to speak and they're not doing a power present, PowerPoint presentation, and I think I answered my own question and playing with the buttons and I did um, speaker view. Speaker view and so they would have the main screen and then if, you know we can still see each other. So I think I answered my own question. That's great, Irene. And that brings up another point as well um, where, there is an option to do something called spotlight, uh, which I think I'll, I'll wait on and address next time, but I'm just going to demonstrate it. So I'm gonna spotlight myself. So even if everyone, does everyone see me large on their screen? Okay, so I've basically forced a speaker view and that's something that I can um, manage as a host or co-host. I can do that, that for myself. It's called spotlighting or I can pick someone else. So um, let's see. So Irene, I'm going to spotlight your video now. Now you are forced in that big screen and that's what everyone is going to see. Okay. okay. So there, there's that option as well. Um, I'm going to cancel the spotlight. And so it's canceled for me. I have to physically go back and change it into gallery view to see everyone else's faces again. So if you would like to try that as well on your computer, um, I'm going to change back to gallery. 
And I'll give you a second to figure out how to do that. You go to the top right hand corner and I you look that, for, the, okay. for the grid. It looks like a Rubik's cube or a tic-tac-toe. And right. then you click on that and then it opens back out into the gallery view. Is everyone back? Is anyone having issues? But thanks for bringing that up, Irene. Um, I think we should address spotlighting as an author next week. And then as a host, do you share the screen, right? So as a host or a co-host, ideally it's just the people who are in charge of the, of the meeting that day. Um, and uh, as we found out, regular participants or attendees are able to screen share unless we hit a, hit a, um, a button beforehand that will prevent them from doing that. But in general, when you open your Zoom meeting from the get-go, everyone has the, the option to screen oh. share. Does that make sense? Myra, where are you? There you are. Do you wanna unmute yourself? All right, let me try. Yeah, you've muted yourself, Myra, so I can't the host. So hopefully, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, Irene. Uh, am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay, I was thinking that, like you said, that it'd be a good idea to start the meeting be, well, before the meeting starts with everybody in the group, uh, you can speak to your um, guest speaker so you can iron out some things and greet them and talk to them a couple of minutes before the meeting starts. So how do you have that connection between you and the speaker and still keep out the rest of the group? That would be a waiting room option. And we can address that next week as well. Um, that's something that you as a host getting into your Zoom meeting before everyone else, you would have to en enable that waiting room to allow for that privacy to occur before the top of the hour or whenever your meeting starts. And so that is an option. If you're using the pro Zoom account that PMD Alliance is, is offering, then uh, it's not um, the default. So when you open it up, the waiting room is not automatically enabled. That's something you have to do as a host. And we can go through that too. Thank you. Thank you for these uh, questions and we will address them. Uh, we have a, mi a minute left. A minute left. Any other burning questions? Myra, I don't think that your microphone is working. You're unmuted, but we still can't hear you. Can That's interesting. So this would be, we can't hear you, Myra. I can see your mouth moving and we don't, yeah. So uh, this would be a perfect time to try that switch to phone audio. So she would use a cell phone or a landline to call in. We can see her, but we cannot hear her for some reason. And usually there's no problem with your computer, Myra. Things happen. <laughs> we just got to work around them. Um, yeah, the question of the PowerPoint presentation is going to be posted uh, on your website. And I guess, Dr. Fox, thanks for, very much for your great presentation. Uh, would that be the same for you, that uh, we could access LSVT perhaps and uh, pull those down? Thank you for, for your kind words. And yes, I believe, Shannon, you have the PowerPoint presentation you can um, share with everyone. Is that something you'd like me to do? Sure, sure. Okay, yeah, thank I think you. That the handout that I sent uh, at the, on Friday, you're more than welcome to share that. Great. Thank you, Doug. I'll turn it into a PDF. Um, so we'll have Cynthia's presentation and then separately, I'll also send a PDF of my training from today. So you can look through the steps and have those to refer to. Um, let me see, I'm gonna share my screen one last time just to show uh, my final uh, screen here. So, just thank you, Cynthia. And thank you, Willa, for um, coming today. Um, this is my email address. If you would have any other ideas that you would like us to include for next Monday's more technical training meeting, please do so. 
In the follow-up email, I'll send those PDFs of both PowerPoint presentations. This is Willa's um, contact information, and I'll include this in the email so you don't have to worry about racing to, to get it down right now. But this is her personal email address she's agreed to provide us. And so what, we're, what she is going to ask from you is where you're located when you contact her, location of your support group, and then would you like an LSVT loud or big speaker? So if you have a preference on the voice versus the, the movement, um, then she can do the research for you, which is really awesome. So our next training is the same time next Monday, 9 a.m. Pacific. On Monday, June 8th, we'll talk about more technical training uh, waiting rooms, PowerPoint screen sharing, those kind of intermediate level functions. And then just one last reminder, we have our online support groups um, here at PMD Alliance. We have three of them each week, one for everyone, one for care partners, and one for those who have loved, loved ones in facilities. So um, I'm going to stop my share and we can wrap this up with two minutes over, but thank you all for being here today. Um, hopefully you've uh, learned some, some good tricks and uh, we will continue our training next week. Thank you, everybody. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Willa. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye.